let's talk about disruption. Now, when a computer scientist stands up and says, let's talk about disruption, they usually mean a disruptive technology. But I want to talk about a different kind of disruption. I want to talk about what happens when families get disrupted. My family was disrupted. I was born in Russia, but my family wasn't doing well there. My dad needed to get us out. And so he decided to leave my mom and me living with extended family while he went abroad to find work in the United States. Between the ages of eight and 10, I saw very little of my dad. We called, but it was so hard for me to connect that disconnected, disembodied voice at the end of the line with the affection, the hugs, and just being with my dad. I didn't really want to talk on the phone, but I also felt really guilty about it. I also experienced disruption from the other side. My little brother is 12 years younger than me. We were close, and I stayed in state for college so that I could watch him grow up. But when it came time to go to grad school, I had to move away and leave him behind. We tried so hard to stay in touch. We had the phone, we had text, we had internet, but yet somehow we still sort of had nothing to talk about when we tried to use these technologies. It was, I felt so frustrated. We live in the most connected age ever. Why couldn't we stay close? Family disruption is more common than most people think. 30% of marriages end before the children have a chance to grow up. A full third of children in the United States just live with one adult. And 12% of children in the United States spend more than a month living away from their primary caregiver. Uh, in my case, with my dad, um, this was because of immigration. But there are at least two other very common reasons in the United States, and those include incarceration and military deployment. And even if none of the above apply, it's becoming more and more common for extended families to live hundreds of miles apart, as was the case with my brother and me. Now, I guarantee you that even if your family has never been disrupted by distance, somebody sitting next to you has. And now, one would think that technology should be able to help, but as I looked into it, I found that lots of families were having experiences similar to mine. They thought that communication technology was inauthentic. It wasn't really a deep communication. And it was kind of boring. So if you read about technology, you know that I'm maybe not the first one to think that technology is not actually delivering on this promise of connecting us. There are countless articles, studies, videos, and books about just this topic. There are so many ways to get it wrong. I want it to do better. There are lots of ways that communication technology can go wrong, but this is one story of what it took to get it right. The first step to getting it right was starting with real people's stories and experiences, using the other instead of the I, rather than guessing at what the technology needed to do. So I started by interviewing people. I talked, I spent hours talking to 24 families where parents and children lived apart. I talked to kids between the ages of seven and 14, and we didn't just talk, I also asked them to draw. I asked them to draw a magical solution to the hardest part of staying in touch with their parents. But first, let me start by telling you something that every single parent said about talking on the phone. They described an almost identical conversation. So we get on the telephone. Hi, son. How are you? Good. What'd you do today? Good. Oh, God, hearing good in response to what you do today, that's even worse than nothing, or I don't know. Uh, he's not even listening to the question. And it's, it's clear why. When I asked the kids about conversations like this, they said, this is boring for both of us. So when they drew solutions to the hardest parts of connecting, they drew things like this magical door that lets a parent in at bedtime to read a bedtime story. It's not about talking. It's about that routine of reading together. But even when families found some engaging topics to talk about, voice-only communication was actually really problematic, especially for the younger children. Young kids are still developing these communicational competencies to understand the finer points of language, like irony, humor, fantasy. Now, in person, you get all of these visual cues to help you. But on the phone, as one parent said, 
I can't even joke with him unless I started with, I have a joke for you, or I have a good one for you. A lot is lost in the expression translation, as the parent put it. Now, kids also thought that voice only was pretty limited. So when they drew solutions, they drew things like this 3D holographic projection for the living room so that their parent could be 3D and life-size and playing alongside with them. Now, finally, there were also some difficulties that only kids from divorced families really picked up on. They were actually real, really aware of the competition between their parents over their time and affection, honestly, even if the parents really tried to hide it. One of the kids said that the hardest part about calling his dad was that when he asked to call his dad, his mom uses that voice, we all know that voice, uh, saying, oh, so you're calling him? And that's hard. So kids drew things like this robot something that could carry secret messages and keep contact with one parent as private from the other parent as possible to reduce that tension between their parents. So the bottom line here is not that we need to build robots or magic doors, but rather what I see is the three main design insights from all of these conversations. First, visual communication is critical, especially for young children. Second, for parents and children, their connection is not about talking to each other. It's about doing things together. Talking is boring. And lastly, kids really need to, to be empowered to initiate conversation because it's so uncomfortable and awkward to go to their dad and ask them to connect with their mom or vice versa. That tension needed to be reduced. So that our second step was actually taking these ideas and trying to design something new, really thinking out of the box. And when I say out of the box, I mean thinking broadly about the kinds of technologies and the kinds of solutions that we consider. I really think that it's a mistake to just start and ask, okay, well, what kind of an app should we build to fix this? Or what kind of a website should we design? It really constrains us to old ways of thinking when we really need something new. And so my team thought broadly. Okay, what if the thing that connects parents and kids is something that they wear? Or what if it's a bracelet or a toy or a series of toys? Or what if it's a tent? We went through several rounds of sketching and getting feedback from families, and we decided to go with a piece of furniture. We call it the share table system. And here's how it works. So when my table rings, to answer it, all I do is open the set of cabinet doors. Now, this starts the video chat so we can see and hear each other, but it also does something else. It turns on a camera and a projector above my table. It captures anything that's happening on one table, sends it to the other table, and projects it on top, and vice versa. So what you're seeing here is us drawing a picture together with just dry erase markers on the surface of the table. Now, one thing about this system is that it doesn't have any buttons, it doesn't have a keyboard, it doesn't have a mouse, it doesn't have any of that. So it doesn't really feel like a technology, it's, it's basically a table with some magic. Now, the idea sounds really simple, but it actually lets you do a surprising variety of things. So let's say you got a worksheet at school and you want help with it, just put it on the table. You want to read a book together? Put it on the table. We can both see it and we can both see where we're pointing on the book or the worksheet. Uh, you want to have a tea party? Grab some cups from the kitchen. You want to play a board game? As long as it's a board game uh, where we can find something to use as dice on two sides and some tokens, we can play together. While the idea is quite simple, the execution ended up being much more complicated than just building a program, though. So first of all, we needed resources like hardware. And to get those resources, we needed to show that this idea could potentially maybe work. And the first version of the system was built with borrowed computers, borrowed projectors, borrowed camcorders that are literally held onto the ceiling with tape and fishing wire. We are lucky that nobody died. <laughs> but it worked well enough to help us get the buy-in and the resources to start actually building the real prototype, the real furniture. Now, I had to learn some things that I did not think were in the purview of a computer scientist. So I had to learn how to make these custom door sensors. I had to learn carpentry. I used a lot of power tools. It was actually pretty cool. <laughs> but there were also lots of other issues. There were some hardware issues we faced that we could address with software. So one of these was that the camera and the projector are not seeing the exact same thing. They're in different places. But we needed to have them to have an identical field of view. And so what we had to do is build a custom piece of software that would calibrate the system using this kind of checkerboard pattern. There were also some software issues that we were able to address with clever hardware solutions. One example is visual echo. 
So visual echo is what happens in a system like this if you recapture something that you've already projected. So your hand from this side gets projected on my side, but then my camera recaptures that and projects it back on your side, and it's an infinite loop. And so what you'd see if you were moving your hand is like this trail of hands following you. So we couldn't have that. We needed some way of preventing the projected items from being recaptured by the cameras. So the solution we ended up using is actually the same technology that you wear when you go to 3D movies, polarized lenses. We created these custom sleeves to attach po different polarized lenses to the camera and the projector. Uh, it worked, but even that took some iteration. We found that the projector was actually so hot that it burned holes through the polarizations on the lenses. Um, and so we had to add a heat shield to protect the lens. So all in all, there were many issues beyond just writing code. And just putting all of this together was pretty complicated. Like, look at that mess of cables behind that box. It was crazy. There were a lot of things that could go wrong. There were a lot of late nights. And all in all, this actually took several years to get it working as well as we wanted it to work. But we couldn't stop there. It doesn't really matter if it works perfectly for us in the lab. What matters is whether it works for real families in the real world. So that was our next step. We recruited four divorced households, and we asked them to keep diaries of their communication practices. Then we left the share table with them for a month and asked them to use it. The system records video anytime a communication session is initiated. But of course, we also wanted to protect the privacy of our participants. So all the names you see are pseudonyms. All the faces will be blurred out. And actually, the parents could mark any videos for deletion before we saw them, though that was pretty rare, and mostly in cases where kids were a little bit too comfortable around nudity in the house, and they didn't want us to see that. Uh, so we're thankful for that. <laughs> uh, so I want to focus on just one family for this talk. Let me tell you a little bit about them, and then I'll show you some of their videos. So let me explain their arrangement. So David and Kelly uh, were married, and they had two kids, Taylor, who was 11 at the time of the study, and Kennedy, who was 7. A few years before they met them, they actually got divorced. Kennedy lives primarily with her mom, while Taylor lives primarily with his dad. And they actually have this idea that the kids always spend the weekends together. So every other weekend, the kids switch houses. So basically, you can imagine this. So if you're a parent, every other Friday, you get your, the kid that lives with you, and you drive them over an hour through traffic, city traffic, to the other side of the city, where you drop them off, and then you do it and pick them up again on Sunday. It's pretty complicated. And also, of course, families are more likely to be blended, so Kelly actually had a new partner, Jason, who was also living with them in Kennedy. This sounds really complicated, but actually these kinds of arrangements, kind of complex arrangements, are pretty common in divorced families. They do what they have to to make their family work. So um, let's watch two of their videos. Um, so the first one highlights a common issue with being a kid from a divorced family. So you have two homes, and all your stuff is divided between these two homes, including your mail. So in this case, the dad got a gaming magazine, and he really wanted to show it to Taylor uh, because it was kind of the holidays were coming up, so it was a little time sensitive. I think he wanted to get a sense of which games to get us gifts. And in the meantime, Taylor's friend from mom's house is also there. So let's see what happens. Battlefield 3. That's, oh! that's it. Do you have Modern Warfare 3 yet? Yes, sir. Why don't we ever see you online? I don't know. What's your gamer tag? You guys never added me. Did see, I don't have you guys. You got Mass Effect on here. Here, here. I, hang on. Let me write on here, and I can write down my gamer tag. Wait, if you write on here, can he see it? Yeah. I'm talking to my son. Tell far. Okay, here's my gamer tag. All right. So there's two things I like about this video. So first, um, it is how quickly kids get used to new technology. If I write on it, you can see it. Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't he be able to? <laughs> That's years of my life. Teens of students. But on a more serious note, the second is the idea of the table as bringing together multiple people. So in a divorced family, it's quite common that kids have like mom's house friends and dad's house friends. Uh, and here you see an opportunity for dad to get to know a friend from mom's house. So they exchange gamer tags. The assumption is that they will play together. Um, so Taylor's world is becoming more interconnected, more integrated, and that's really important. Now, this next video 
I want to show you something that was a little bit surprising to us as a use. So we made this table thinking it was going to be used for things like helping with homework and reading together and drawing together, and we did see all of these things. But here you'll see a little bit more unusual of a use to communicate emotional comfort. So in this video, Taylor's on the other side, and he's not feeling well. And so his mom and his sister are calling him. Now, it's a little hard to see, but look at what she does with her hand. Do you see my hand holding onto your hand? Yes, I do. I love you, baby. Love you too. Hi, Baba. There's my hand. Yeah, keep your hands in there. We're going to do a family handshake, okay? Now, some of you are going to want to hear quantitative metrics. And there were some. The amount of communication more than doubled uh, for these families. These children were initiating more than half of the conversations, whereas with the previous technology, it was basically none. And the relationship between the parents and the children improved. But to me, it was not about the numbers. It was really seeing that video that made all of the late nights worth it. It was hearing a dad say, there's something about it. When you put your hand on the table and your daughter puts her hand on top, where it feels like you're almost touching. So to me, that was the real success of the share table. Now, of course, we can't stop there. In my recent work, I'm working with a great team of students at the University of Minnesota, and we're scaling up these ideas, because we really have to be able to deploy with more than four households. <laughs> <laughs> so it needs to be not just something that we can deploy with some of them, yeah. So we've transitioned to a much more robust system with a built-in camera and projector. We actually had to redesign our software from ground up in order to do this. And we're now working to address new interesting challenges and new interesting contexts of separation. But with all this optimism, I think it is really important to remember, technology won't fix families. Technology can be misused. Any technology can be used to connect or disconnect. But I think this is not an excuse for computer scientists to step back. I think it's actually a call for technologists to engage more. And I don't mean engage more with the technology. I mean engage with real stories, real experiences, take risks in the design, and actually see what happens when what you build is used in the real world. I call for technologists to step up to the challenge and do the work to design for real human needs. Yes, families get disrupted, and there are so many reasons for that. But there are also ways to get reconnected. I know in my own life, I had plenty of happy endings. My dad was eventually able to bring my mom and me to the United States, and we were able to connect again. My brother, he grew up, and we have lots of ways of connecting now, and we take plenty of opportunities to visit each other in person. In fact, he flew here from Maryland to be here for my talk today. But I'm... <laughs> I'm not going to embarrass him by making him wave, but you'll probably see him at the after party. He's six foot four, so he's hard, hard to miss. <laughs> but for other families, it may not be enough to wait until they're together in person. There need to be other tools and other ways of connecting and other ways of finding their happy endings. And I really hope that my work gets us just one step closer to that. And so I dedicate this talk to more happy endings. <laughs>